Welcome back. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for coming and spending your Sunday morning with us. If you're new here every week, we um, have some teaching from the Bible, and I'm going to uh, bring that to us today. My name is Matt, uh, one of the elders here, and um, we're in our transforming series, Transforming for Good. Uh, we're looking at the passage in Nehemiah uh, in chapter 8. So if you have a Bible, want to turn there, the words uh, will appear on the screen as well. We'll be reading from verse uh, 13. Let me read. In my Bible, this is titled, The Feast, Feast of Booths Celebrated. Nehemiah eight thirteen. On the second day, the heads, heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, with the priests and the Levites, came to, together to Ezra the scribe, in order uh, to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. And so the people went out and brought, uh, brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths, for from the days of Jeshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. That's our passage for today. If we're uh, honest... I think if we had come across this passage as we were reading through the Bible, this is probably one of those ones that we go, hmm, that's interesting, skip to the next page. <laughs> it's not really particularly something that leaps out to us and, or speaks to us directly. How is this relevant uh, to us here in Brighton uh, today? There is, it's a difficult one. So I kind of feel like I've been a bit you know, stitched up here by Joel, to be honest. <laughs> You know, there's not many opportunities that I get to, uh, to preach God's Word to you. I mean, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do so today. Joel normally does most of the preaching. It seems a little bit convenient to me uh, that he's, a, he's, <laughs> he's away this week. And, uh, oh, Matt, you can preach on this, this passage, Feast of Booze. Oh, thanks, Joel. Um, but here we are, nonetheless. Because the thing is, Nehemiah, it's an inspiring book. I mean, if you've been with us over the last, uh, last few weeks, well, since the start of the, the year, really, we've been looking at the story of Nehemiah, and, and it's inspiring. It's a kind of against all odds kind of story. There's this man called Nehemiah, as the title suggests, and uh, he's, he's part of God's people, the people of Israel. And the story starts, actually, where God's people are in a very bad place. They're in captivity. They've been overrun uh, by their enemies. And the reason that's happened is, actually, there were once a great nation, but they forgot about God, and they forgot about God's word, and they abandoned God, and therefore God gave them over so that their enemies might overtake them, and that's what happened, that's important. But anyway, that's where the story starts, and Nehemiah hears word, he's been taken away to a different land, and he hears word about the capital city of Jerusalem, and the fact that it's in ruins, and he weeps over it. He's devastated. This is what's happened to his you know, home uh, city. And um, so as you know, as you've been with us for the last few weeks, what happens is that he gets stirred by God to go back and he asks the king whether he's able to go back and rebuild the city. And amazingly, miraculously, he has the opportunity to do that. He gathers some of God's people together and they begin to rebuild the walls. And um, there's opposition on every side, there's threats against their lives, it's a difficult job, but they manage to do it, and they rebuild the walls. And it's a great heroic story of, of a, kind of against all odds. And then last week when Simon was uh, preaching to us about the passage just before this, they, this people had been restored in some way, the, the walls have been restored, and uh, they're kind of getting back who they are as God's people, and so they return to God's word, and that's what we looked at last week. They would look back at what God's word had to say to them, and they realized when they did that how far they'd come from what God wanted for them. And uh, Simon preached to us last week about how the people wept, and they were devastated, but then their joy was returned to them. 
Simon talked about how, you know, the joy and repentance and turning back to God and, and, and God blessing them and saying, no, this is a, this is a day of, that God is with you. You don't have to weep because God can uh, give strength to you and give joy to you and you can enjoy the blessing and favor of God. And so that was where we uh, were last week. And so this passage starts off on the second day. So basically not everyone comes back. So the family heads come back together and they have a Bible study basically. They come back to study the Bible. And so this is our passage we're reading in the Bible about people in the Bible reading the Bible. And they're reading about this uh, feast that it was said in Leviticus, if you flick back in your Bible, Leviticus chapter 23, this is one of the feasts that, that God said they were to have. Essentially, it's about tents. When it says booths here, it's a kind of makeshift tents they put together and kind of Bear Grylls style, getting twigs and trees and, and putting, making them a little tents in their driveways, on their roofs. That's what it talks about. And they were to do this for a whole week, and that's what they did. It's about camping. So I get the message about camping to preach to you this morning. I don't know if camping is something that excites you or something that you enjoy. To be honest, I've not got a huge amount of personal experience of, of camping um, because my, we, we never really went camping as uh, growing up. My uh, two brothers, uh, mum and dad, and uh, we, we never went camping. And so at one point I asked my mum, like, you know, I heard other people, friends went camping or whatever, and we never went on a camping holiday. So I was like, what, mum, what's that about? And um, she said to me, yeah, we're not going camping be because I've been camping and I'm not going again. <laughs> and in her eyes, I could just see the sort of misery of holiday after miserable holiday, wet weather in Ireland and Scotland, camping with her family that she had to endure through her childhood. All these uh, miserable holidays that were uncomfortable and wet and she hated it. So as soon as she could do anything about it, we're never going camping again. So we didn't actually go camping. Um, but that, that was us. Maybe, maybe you have. Uh, but we got, as we read this, it's kind of a festival environment. You know, it's a feast, it's a celebration, and they're intense. So our kind of music festivals that we have, that might not too be too dissimilar uh, to what's going on here. I'm sure there would have been music, there would have been feasting, there would have been celebration. It would be a, a great um, kind of occasion for them as a community. But it's not just about that, it's much more than that. It's much more than that in this passage. But I do want to pick up on this kind of idea, you know, our, our reaction to a passage like this. It does kind of seem irrelevant. But I think one of the reasons that we kind of feel that or have that attitude and why we're really tempted, as I was, to want to skip on to something more inspiring in the book of Nehemiah is really often when we read the Bible, we come to it and we want, we're keen to, well, find something for it to tell us to do. We often turn to the Bible in that way. Maybe we're feeling uh, or facing a difficult situation or challenge in life. And what does the Bible have to say to us? Uh, what, what would God have me to do? And, you know, we hear about the fact that the, the Bible is a book of wisdom. And so at times that we might need wisdom, we might want to turn to the Bible. And so if we turn to a passage like this, we might think, well, that's not particularly relevant to me. I'll try and find something else in the Bible that speaks more directly and gives me something to do. And now it's not wrong to ask those questions like, God, what do you want me to do? Or what's God's wisdom for my life today? Nothing wrong with asking those questions, but there is a danger in that we might always come to the Bible and approach the Bible and think about the Bible in that way. Um, because we maybe m will miss out, we will miss out on what God wants to say to us. Because actually, a lot of the time, especially as we read through the Old Testament, God seems more interested in telling us about what he has done rather than what he wants us to do. He's very happy to spend a long time telling us about what he has done. Sometimes we want to treat the Bible like a kind of instruction manual to life. It's going to help me live my life. But one of the problems with that is that we get loads of instruction manuals to loads of things and most of the time we don't look at them at all. Every piece of equipment, especially electronic equipment that you have in your house, probably came with an instruction manual, didn't it? Your microwave, TV, DVD player, whatever, it comes with an instruction manual. What do we do with them? We just, well, we don't even look at them. We put them in a drawer or put them in a bin or whatever. We just get on. We just do it. And it, it's really only when something goes drastically wrong 
But it's a last resort. We might dig out the manual to say, I don't know, what, how do we sort this out? If my, if my wife Catherine presses a button on the TV and some symbol comes up and um, it doesn't seem to go away. You ever heard that? It's never happened to me. Catherine would never do that. But if it did, I would try every single button. I would turn the TV off. I'd turn it back on again. Try and go through all the different options of fixing it myself before I would, you know, turn to the instruction manual. That would be the last resort thing to do. And I think that's the way some people, uh, many people in fact, uh, treat the Bible, treat Christianity, treat religion. It's kind of a last resort. Wow, you, you're turning to the Bible for answers. Well, something must be really be wrong. You know, you got to a desperate situation. You have to turn to, you know, God's wisdom or whatever as a solution to, the, to whatever has gone, gone on in your life. But that's not what the Bible is about really about. It's, it's primarily the Bible is God's disclosure of who He is. It's not just pithy sayings that help us navigate life. It includes that, but God's more concerned about telling us about who He is. And that is exactly, actually, what this Feast of Booths is about. Why, are they, why does God want them to get into tents and live just basically outside their house but in a tent for a week? It's because God wants to remind them about what he has done. And he wants to remind them about their history in him. Because what this is referring to is people of God's history when God led them through the wilderness. If you know anything about uh, the Old Testament, you'll probably have come across the story of the Exodus, the story of Moses. And God's people for many years were in slavery in Egypt. And God used a man called Moses who um, was a, quite an old man at that time and he was a murderer and he was uh, a farmer that lived many miles away from the rest of God's people. But God plucked him out and said, I want to use you to lead my people out. And that's an amazing story that kind of uh, is right at the heart of this Old Testament and right at the heart of the Bible in many ways of God leading his people out. And God took miraculously his people from a place of captivity and slavery into the promised land. And he led them all the way. And it was a journey that took many years. But he led them all the way through. It wasn't an easy journey. They, and for many years they were living in the wilderness. And there were challenges and there, there was difficult for them. But every step of the way God provided for them. And he didn't leave them. And he had a destination that he eventually got them to despite their disobedience. And it's a great story of the Bible. And the Feast of Booths is all about remembering that's where they were. And remembering that God led them through the wilderness. And he provided for them. They were on a camping holiday for 40 years. But God was with them. And so this act of getting back into tents for a week is remembering that significant thing. That God uh, led them through. That was their history. This idea of kind of doing something or having a festival that remembers something significant in history is, is not that common in our, our culture, I don't, I don't think, but even, I was just even thinking, even this weekend, there are some things that are significant and that we do do something physical, do something a bit different just to mark the occasion. I mean, just uh, if you follow football, you'll know that this weekend all the, the games uh, were started seven minutes later than they usually do as a mark of remembrance, there's a minute silence uh, on the 25th anniversary of the Hillsborough disaster, you know, 25 years ago. 1989, uh, 96 Liverpool fans uh, lost their lives, uh, uh, crushed to death on the terraces. And that's, that was an, a significant, tragic uh, event in the kind of history of our country, certainly the sporting history of our, our country. And it's important that uh, we don't forget that. There's lessons to be learned and there's, uh, there's, it's important that that is marked. Because when you think about it, yesterday there would have been thousands of kids, children at those games around the country uh, that weren't around when the Hillsborough disaster happened. And they, therefore, this doing something different, they would have said, oh, what happened? What, what was Hillsborough about? And so one generation to the next generation told, will be telling them, this is what happened. And this is why it's important to remember it. And this is uh, significant for us uh, uh, as, a, you know, as part of our history. And in, in other ways, we do it more generally every year with Remembrance Sunday and things like that. Because there's some things that happen that are so significant that it's important that the next generation knows about it. 
And for this, God's people in this time, it was even more important that they pass things on generation to generation. They didn't have the kind of record keeping that we have now and history books that we have now that record things. But even with all those things, it's easy for things to be forgotten from generation to generation. But here God is reminding them God is reminding them of a significant thing. You know, I've given some negative examples, but this was a very positive thing. He wanted them to celebrate because God was still with them. Because actually, this is exactly what had happened to the God's people. They had lost their sense of history. And when they lost, they'd forgotten about, they neglected God's word. They forgot about what God did. They tried to forge their own identity based on their current circumstances and that's what led them into the mess that they got themselves into by the time of the start of the book of Nehemiah in the first place they abandoned God it's almost you see this this passage said they not celebrated this since the time of Joshua Joshua was the one who led the people into the promised land but from that almost as soon as they got to a place of blessing and prosperity that God had led them into they were presumptuous about it And they thought they didn't need to read God's word anymore. And slowly, as years went by, they forgot their history. They forgot to base themselves and their identity on what God had done for them and who God was to them. And what happened was that they took in other gods and they started worshipping other gods. And you might think, how, how did they do that? That was so stupid of them to do that. It's so obvious God has led them this far. And we might think that, you know, we would never do something so stupid. But for all of us, I think, we're all tempted to base our identity on our present circumstance. What's around us, what happens to us, and things like that. I think we are. I think those temptations are very real. You know, when, when something happens to us in the workplace, when we get a promotion, or when we do, uh, you know, get a new job or something like that. Anyways, that's a good thing, but if we're not careful, that can become who we are. We act differently, we, we change something about who we are because we get that. Or on the, other, on the flip side, we might lose our job. And that's, that's not, a, you know, not a nice thing to happen to anyone, but if we're not careful, it can become almost our identity. We feel like a failure. Not just that this has happened to us, but it speaks into something that who we are and the way other people perceive us and that sort of thing. We can, it can challenge our identity. Or we go through a, a breakup of relationship or whatever and we can be rejected. All these things, you know, we go through life, friends, and we, we get these, I guess, identity labels stuck on us. That we're successful or we're a failure or we're rich or we're poor. Just, just through life, they just, they just happen. What people th- say about us, words that people speak to us, that you're like that. And some of, you know, for, for these labels that get stuck to us, for some of us it's like we can be proud about them, we can wear them with proud, yes, I'm great at my job. No, there's nothing wrong with being great at your job, but is that who you are? Is that your identity? Or you've been rejected or abused or... Easily we can bec- have a sense of that as who we are. I'm a, I'm a victim or, or whatever. We, the circumstance we're in can define who we are. But God wants to remind his people, and I believe God wants to, to remind us today, that who we are is not defined by our current circumstances. It's not defined by our role. It's not defined by what we do. It's defined by what God has done. It's defined by what God has done. For me, myself, I, you know, in the, in the last few weeks, I've, I've, I've become an elder and I've become a student. Two, two things that have happened and two kind of labels that I, I have now. And they're, they're good things. I enjoy those things. But is that all, of, all who I am now? I love this quote from uh, Robert Murray McShane. He says, a man is what he is on his knees before God and nothing more. A man is what he is on his knees before God and nothing more. We can pick up labels, but who we are in relation to God gives us our identity. And I want us to think about that. Who are we? As we come together today to worship God and to pray to Him and to hear His word together, who are we? I believe God wants to remind us that our identity in what He has done, and we need to look to the cross today to recognize that and see that, that we're God's people. When God is speaking to his people in the Bible here, 
We are God's people. When God makes promises and says, you'll be my people, I'll be your God, that's the promise he makes to us and that defines our identity today. We're not a defeated people because Christ has won a victory on the cross. And therefore, we have life and we have freedom. And we are accepted by God because Christ has been rejected on the cross. We are accepted by God. That's who we are. No matter what people say about us, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, friends, as God's people here this morning, we're fathered by Him. We're not an aimless people. God has bestowed on us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us a message. He's given us good news to share with the world. The Bible says God has raised us up in heavenly places. That's our identity today. We're seated alongside Christ in heavenly places. When we come together to worship God as we've been doing this morning, God's Spirit comes and dwells amongst us. That's what it means to be God's people. That's what it means to be God's people. We're a holy temple. The Bible says we're more than conquerors. The Bible says if we're in Christ, we're new creations. We're new creations. Some of us, you know, we come from maybe difficult backgrounds and, or whatever background we're from. There are things that can maybe we think might define us or we think might shape us or we have a family name and it has associations with all sorts of different things. But the Bible says when we become a Christian, when we put our trust in Christ and we're coming to God's family, we're new creations. We have a new family history. And it starts with God and it starts with what God has done. That's what it means to be God's people. And can you see the grace here? Because God is wanting to remind his people exactly this. This is who you are. But the thing is, they've rejected God for many, many years. And they've strayed so far from him. But it is an amazing act of grace, I think, that God reminds them of this feast. Because what he's saying to them is, despite your disobedience, you're still my people. Despite them breaking covenant, despite them worshipping other gods, you know, idolatry right in God's face. But God says, you're still my people. You see, they've not become God's people because of their obedience. In fact, it's despite their obedience because God has made promises to them. And God has been merciful to them and God has shown his grace to them. You know, think about what the story of Nehemiah could have been if God, and God had every right to, just uh, let, um, let God's people go their own way after they rejected him. What would the story of Nehemiah look like? Nehemiah there in captivity. He is about the city of Jerusalem in ruins. Weeps over the city. He's devastated. This is what happened. And so, okay, he goes, right, I'm going to go to the king and I'm going to ask for permission to, uh, to go back and rebuild the city. And if God's favor hadn't been on it, what would have happened? Nehemiah goes to the king, can you let me go back and rebuild my city? The king says, what? What? And swiftly removes Nehemiah's head from the rest of his body. That's what would have happened. The story of Nehemiah would be very, very short. That would have been it. Paragraph. End of story. No way back for God's people. But God shows his grace that he restores his people even though they didn't deserve it. And everything that we have in Christ, when the Bible says every spiritual gift is ours in Christ Jesus, it's not because of our great faithfulness and obedience to him. It's because of Christ's obedience and God's grace to us. And that, friends, defines who we are. That's who we are. Because of what God has done for us, that gives us our identity. We're his people. And that's why, that's why we, it's so important for us to come together as we do on Sundays to celebrate this because as a church we have a shared identity in the same way that God is, was leading his people through the wilderness. God is leading his church today. And we come together and we sing songs of this is what God has done and this is the way that God has been faithful to us and this is what the Bible says because we have a shared history and we remind and encourage one another this is what God is, is like. Because what God has done before, God can do again, and God will do again. You know, to give a personal uh, example from my life, a few weeks ago, we, we moved house just uh, a bit closer into the center of the city, and um, 
we, we wanted to move for a few, uh, few months, quite a few months actually. We were just renting, so it, it's not quite as complicated as moving house, buying a place. But anyway, we, we wanted, to, wanted to move and we saw a few places and it, was, um, it wasn't really working out. It was months. We couldn't find anywhere that, that fitted us right. And um, it was frustrating and uh, kind of annoying. And it was, it was easy to kind of worry. And it's like, is God, where are you? Is this really going to work out? Is this really going to... Um, it's going to really come good. And I remember thinking about that, and I felt that God reminded me as I sat in my flat, these walls around me were already an answer to prayer from God because three or so years ago, just before Catherine and I got married, you know, we were looking for a flat, and, and really that, that was, that was going to stressful run up to the wedding because we were desperately looking for a flat, couldn't find uh, anywhere. It was really um, close to the wire, and I remember praying like I never prayed before <laughs> for God to provide. We, you know, we almost became, you know, homeless newlyweds, uh, but w- I was praying, and God provided, and we w- found that flat, we moved in, and it's been a great flat for us, and that was God's provision to us for a number of years, and I remember that. I felt God reminded me of that, and so knowing what God had done there, I thought, well, if God's done that then, then he can do it again. And sure enough, you know, we prayed and God provided and we moved into a, a new flat a few weeks ago. And I think it's important for us to, even in our own personal lives, to remember what God has done before. Yeah. It's so easy to, for us to forget the prayers that God answers. And God does something in our life and we don't take note of it and we don't remember it. And then we move into a difficult situation and think, oh, th- this is not going to work out anymore. And we forget what God has done. Let's remind one another. Let's remind ourselves what God has done. What God has done before, he'll do again. And that's what he's reminding his people here today. Just before we finish, I want to uh, share one more thing from this passage. Because I think it's important to point out just the obedience that we see. The obedience that we see from God's people. After so long of disobeying God... Here they read something in the scriptures, they, they find it out, it's kind of surprising, they weren't expecting to find it. And immediately they obey, immediately they do what the Bible says. Leviticus 23, they should have this festival, and so straight away they go out and do it. And I want us to see this progression between identity, knowing who we are, knowing it, that's defined by what God has done for us. Secondly, obeying God, and then thirdly, moving into blessing. Because when they obey... It says in here there was great rejoicing. There's a blessing that comes from it. But let's think about obedience for a moment. Because it's easy for us, you know, all of us, when we read God's Word, there are things in it that challenge us. There are things that um, conflict maybe even with the things that we're doing in life. You know, God's got a lot to say about um, things that challenge us, about generosity, about loving others, about forgiving others, about uh, behaving, about the way we, we speak to others and how we relate to others. There are many different things that can challenge us. And the question is, how do we respond? How do we respond to God's Word? One of the things that we can do is, sometimes actually we can even use God's love for us as a reason not to obey God. Sometimes we're, when we talk about God's instruction and God's commandment, there can be a temptation to say, oh, it's legalism. Legalism. But actually, what is legalism? Legalism is when we obey God in order to get God's favor. But this is not what's going on here. No, it's because they've already, they, God's reminded them of who they are, therefore they obey. God's reminded them of grace, therefore they obey out of love. Because Jesus puts it very plainly, John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Love for God is doing what God says. You know, love for God isn't how passionately we sing or how much of the Bible we know. Love for God is expressed in doing what God says and being obedient to Him. And this is a challenge for all of us. There are always things that we come across in the Bible, things that we hear uh, preached about what God says to us and what He'll have us do, and we've got a decision, what do we do about it? One of the easiest things to do, I, th- I find personally, is to agree, is to agree, oh, yeah, I should do that. That's the thing that would be good to do. And then we kind of have the mentality, well, I'll, 
I'll, I'll encourage that person or I'll forgive that person when I bump into them or when I see them or next time, next time is a gift day, then I'll, make, then I'll give. Or we, we kind of make giving a, or a being obedient on our terms and we delay. That's not what happens here. These people don't give a sort of cursory nod, oh, we should, that festival, yeah, okay, we'll have a little service and, and not really follow the rest of it. Or we'll do that next week. No, is that wow, we've not been doing this festival. We need to do it right now because that's what God says. Because it says in James 1, 22, you know, if we're, if we're saying that we're obeying God's word but we're not doing anything about it, we're just agreeing, we're, we're deceived. We're deceived, we're thinking we're obeying God's word but we're not because we're not acting it out. And I want to encourage us this morning, are we readers of God's word? Brilliant. Let's read God's word but let's do God's word as well. Let's be doers uh, of the word. Because from that comes blessing. There is blessing. There is life in God's word. It says in this passage, there was great rejoicing. And of course, this kind of festival, it would have been a fun thing to do. It would have been uh, a time of great rejoicing. You know, kind of festival environment, food uh, and music and dancing and all those kind of things. It would have been fun thing to do. But I don't actually think that this, um, when it says there was great rejoicing, is completely because it was just a fun thing to do. I think there's something more significant here. I think what they're experiencing is the joy of being back in God's will, of being where God wanted them to be and doing what God wanted them to do. Do you know that peace in your life and joy that, that comes from being right before God? If you've, been, if you've been camping, you know that sleeping is not the m- always, always the most uh, comfortable experience. But I believe these people would have slept soundly at night because they, they were back in God's will. God was with them. They were being obedient. There's a peace that comes from that. You know, in our lives, there can be so many things that, that potentially keep us up at night. Worries about the future, about what we're doing, about family members, about our workplace or whatever. But there's a peace that comes from knowing that we're right before God. That God's in control and we're following His ways. And there's joy that comes from that. You see, God's word to us is it's difficult at times. It does challenge us. It does. God, but God wants to shape us in that. God's a good Father who loves us and wants to shape us and wants to change us. And God's instruction to us is not meant to be a a burden to us. But when God's word does challenge us, and when we are convicted of things, we must remember that God's commandments to us is, is, is God's hand reaching out to us and saying, come with me, I want to teach you my ways. I want to teach you my ways. And obedience is reaching out and taking God's hand. And the joy that comes from that is knowing that God never lets us go. And that's what I believe these people are experiencing here. Coming back, being restored to God, taking His hand again, and knowing the joy of following Him day to day. And the amazing thing is that they weren't going to do it perfectly. Just like before, they were going to fall short. And all of us fall short. All of us are not as obedient as we should be or we could be. We all fall short. We all, our grip on God's hand always loosens. We always get distracted by other things. But God never lets us go. He holds our hand and He's committed to say, Come, come again. Let me pick you up. Come and follow my ways once again. That's the God that we know, that's the God that we worship. That's the God who is with us, just like He was with His people as He led them through the wilderness, just as He was with His people and restored them in the time of Nehemiah. He's with us today and He's leading us today and His grace is still for us today. Let me pray, the band will come up and we'll worship God together. God, we thank You so much that You are the same God whose nature is always to have mercy. And I thank You that today, Whatever situation, whether we're going through the wilderness, whether we're in the throes of joy and celebration, Lord God, you're the same God and you hold our hand.
and you lead us in your ways. And I thank you that this church is, in, is safe because we're in your hands and you're leading us. And I pray, Lord God, that you'd give us willing hearts to follow you, to follow your ways, and to speak this good news to our city that doesn't know it. And we would know the blessing and peace that comes from being in your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.